Welcome to a series of talks on the subject of From Art to Science in Search of Reality. I am Marcello Costa. I just retired and I become a Matthew Flinders Distinguished Emeritus Professor of Flinders University. After 60 years of research in neuroscience and 47 years of service to Flinders University, in the Department of uh, Human Physiology as Professor of Neurophysiology. Indeed, I would like to cover some areas that uh, um, I remain very interested for a long time, and I'm going to cover the shift between the original paintings of the ancient art all the way to modern science. So, these talks are in eight parts. The first one from Cape Painting to the Roman Realism. Then I'm going to cover in part two from the decadence of the Roman Realism throughout the period of uh, Christianity to Renaissance in Central Italy. Then I'm going to cover in part three the importance of using geometry applied to physics again from the Renaissance on. Then I'm going to deal in part one in general with the application of geometry to nature, a study of nature. Then in part five, the geometry to dynamic processes in the world, in physics and biology. Then I'm going to go back to painting in part six of painting beyond visual reality with the birth of uh, Impressionism, and uh, modernity with all the aspects of abstract art. This will take me to talk in part seven, or beginning how the painters already uh, started in a way without realizing how the brain constructs visual experiences. And in a way, I end with part eight, again, how the paintings has helped to explore how the minds work, and eventually, therefore, how art and science are merged continuously into one, requiring the same attributes by humankind of imagination, discipline, and high respect of the experience with reality. I hope you have a good time. Humans, like all other living beings, come from a single ancestor a few thousand millions years ago. You can see the animals here appear about half a billion years ago, and you can see that they belong to the same tree of life as bacteria, which were the, almost the first living being on Earth. So we share a lot with all the existing living beings. Specifically, all mammals share some fundamental behaviors for survival. Well, these are the ability of moving around, what we call the exploring or spontaneous locomotion, escaping and defense reactions, life supporting activities like breathing air, drinking water, and eating food, and naturally reproducing for the maintenance of a species. The sharing of experiences in humans, as social animals, is definitely critical for survival. The main aim of my lectures is to link the sharing of visual experiences, begun as art, to develop the development of science. Let's see how we go. Well, the aim can be summarized in the following way. I will try to summarize the way in which human shared information, leaving external records of what they saw or imagined. To search for a common thread that links visual art to science by exploring the way in which humans began to draw and paint what they experienced visually with increasing realism. To find how visual representation led to, in some cultures, to the development of a written language, increase in abstract symbols, and to increasingly realistic paintings of things in space by applying geometry. 
then to link the geometry of space to the development of modern physics, to understand how painting began, to reveal how the brain takes a major role in how we see what we see, and eventually to give a unified perspective of the way in which the human brain generates art and science to explore the inner and the surrounding world. I don't pretend that this unified perspective should have followed a very tight line in history, prehistory and history. It was probably a semi-random process of cumulative events, which now I put them in a common perspective, just to simplify our understanding. Well, this shows a simple, fairly basic uh, understanding of the evolution of uh, mammals, with us there in good company with chimpanzees and gorilla. We separated from them only a few million years ago. And the way in which all this happened has been complicated and people, researchers in this area, researchers in this area are increasingly understanding the complexity of how this happened from the very beginning in Africa. Well, speech and gestures were the earliest form of sharing experiences in humans. Representation of visual experiences has been a powerful form of communication for sharing such experiences. History of visual representation, from prehistory to modern science then, is part of a history of a quest of knowledge. Welcome back from my introduction of a series of talks on From Art to Science, In Search of Reality. I am Marcella Costa and I am a Distinguished Emeritus Professor of Flinders University. In this first talk, I would like to cover the era from the very prehistoric cave paintings all the way to the Roman art with its realism. Cave paintings and rock art were the first form of graphic reproduction of visual experiences and developed certainly into good realism in the Roman culture. Let's see how this happened. From the realization that the, in prehistoric time there was a lot of painting in cave that came really already from the 1800s, the discovery of Altamira caves in Spain, and then of course in France, in Lascaux, and since then a little bit around the world, that all the culture really show the initial skills and abilities to depict something on the rock of the caves or on the rock outside and in some sheltered areas. Among the first, we have the hand painting. Already in Indonesia, 40,000 years ago, in Australia, this one's a fairly recent, but some signs were, were observed already, probably similar time, 40, 50,000 years ago. The different culture wanted to leave a mark of their own hands, either negative, you can see on the left here, or positive. This happened in Europe, in France, several hundred thousand, ten thousand years ago. More recently, all the way to the Patagonia, where the humans arrived only about 11,000 years ago. And they also left their hands, just like the, the, the other humans in other parts of the world. So this developed quite independently from each other. This means the human had this desire to leave a mark of themselves in this particular case, through hands. But of course, they painted also animals. They painted uh, their own silhouettes, humans. And they painted, of course, plenty of complexity, including animals jumping, running, filling their bodies, putting them on top of each other, so giving a sense, indeed, of distances. So this really developed a long time ago and uh, probably uh, we still have a long way to understand exactly why and what they were depicting. But in a way, the modern humans originated almost certainly more than 100,000 years ago, close to 2,000 years ago, as Homo sapiens. They probably coexisted with the Neanderthal until about 40, 50,000 years ago when indeed cave painting started to be uh, expressed. A 
kind of a pictorial representation of what people saw, a kind of a perceptual realization of there's something there, and by hand, humans could actually remember that by reproducing that and keeping that for memory. Well, from those early paintings, of course, very quickly, there was a shift into more abstract, stylized figures. They remained there probably dormant for quite a while, all the way to the, to the petroglyphs in, in the New Stone Age. You can see here in the Iberian Peninsula some petroglyphs from looking like humans, anthropomorphic images. You can see some other uh, signs or some other drawings which became more abstract. This is probably the shift between a visual representation to the writing. The writing then, of course, developed in full in the, in the period about the 4th and 5th millennia BC in the population of the Mesopotamian or Fertile Crescent, included the Sumerian, Babylonians, Assyrians, Hittites and Egyptians during what we call the Bronze Age. The, the, the writing took a form of wedge shape uh, imprinted by a stylus on soft clay tablets and this web shape became what we call the cuneiform writing system, which now is well known and well studied. We can add now this last 10,000 years from the New Stone Age, where we're still widespread having painting around the world, and where proto writing started with the petroglyphs I showed you before. Then, about five and a half thousand years ago, the cuneiform started in Mesopotamia, as I mentioned, and about the, at the same time, a bit later, but not much, in China, the ideograms, and in Egypt, the hieroglyphics, or the hieroglyphs. Then the more modern kind of uh, writing started with the alphabet. That was actually a modified form of the hieroglyphics, the hieroglyphs from Egypt. The Phoenicians did that in the Middle East and then the, the, in the islands of the Mediterranean, the Mycenaeans, a bit later, started there was called the Linear B writing. And since then now we have indeed a more modern alphabet, or we call the modern alphabet. I put here the three main sequential uh, civilizations, the Greeks, the Roman, the Europeans, because it's there where most of the development of paintings really develop to modern times. This shows the too high period of the Greek Renaissance, about 100 BC, and uh, the European Renaissance in Italy about 100 years ago. This reminds us indeed the shift between pictorial science in the time of the Sumerian culture into more abstract uh, signs that became indeed the cuneiform language in, in the Babylonian and Assyrian periods. This simply shows that there are many kinds of forms of writings. The Sumerian, we saw how that generated the cuneiform, became the old Persian cuneiform. The Egyptian hieroglyphic indeed became the, 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 the more modern writing. And we, we still have the Chinese syllabograms that gave us the, the, the Chinese writing, the Indian Devanagari, and of course the Roman alphabet, which is widespread now on the global earth. First, the first cave paintings of, were, were animals were drawn as outlines. That's important, as we'll see later on, the importance of lines as a way of, of uh, describing what people see. Then the original painters in these caves added the filling in of this outline and the, the, even the overlap between animals, and that gave a sense of space uh, by thanks to the overlapping images. If you come a bit closer to us, 4,000 years ago, 2000 BC, you can see that in the pre-dynastic Egyptian, you begin to see some simple drawings of animals and of people. In this case, simple traits 
without even the, the outlines, were just actually uh, almost becoming more symbolic. In the in the various civilization, about 3,300 to about 1,700 BC, some rock paintings show some some drawings of animals uh, and humans on top of them, and uh, that really shows the similar abilities really scattered around the world. The Sumerian painting were also fairly simple, outline, field images, always taken in profiles, showing complex lives and complex uh, uh, stories, and this emerged indeed about 600, 6,000 6, years ago. The Indian culture developed uh, carving and painting representation with very strong linear contours that was typical of many, many civilizations. You can tell even the Mycenaean culture close to us in, in the Mediterranean shows strong outlines of the images of warriors and filling of spaces. In, this, in that culture, the Crete Mycenaean painting, you can see beautiful line drawings of uh, life images, again overlapping with each other, with the field areas, different colors. So we can see all this aspect of painting uh, that are actually are beginning to emerge very clearly. The outlining, the filling of the outline images with colors, and then the overlapping of images. The most elegant, of course, outline in this uh, Santorini island in the Mycenaean culture and the filled in entirely filled images showing youngsters having sort of some, some, uh, uh, some fights, uh, sport fight, and you can see the elegance of this already well developed by then. But something happened for the first time about the 5th, the 6th century in Greece in the before Christ era. The red painter, because painted the red head, uh, here you can see a face now is no longer in profile, but faces on one side. This is one of the first examples, if you like, of creating a sense of space simply by not being uh, um, sharp images against a wall. Remain in this outline still for a long time. Before then, of course, both in Egypt, you can tell here from the from the Theban necropolis, some uh, sculptures begin to emerge in three dimensions. In the in the Assyrians, uh, in Babylonians, and in the Greeks. In the Greeks, suddenly Greek in Greece, of course, from the 500 BC. At the peak of the Renaissance, they achieve realistic representation of the human body, with expressions of human really looking at you. This realism was uh, reached its top, really, uh, towards the, the 200 and 100 BC in Greece, when already the Roman Empire was already developing quite fast. In fact, if you go back to the uh, to the maps, you can see here the the Greek world with the dealers at the center, you can see, by the way, all the, 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 the Greek culture accepted quite well the symbols of sex. And you can see many, many names whereby Greece achieved the incredible realism. The Roman pushed that even beyond. You can see here a statue left by then and how it was, probably was full of color. And they really began to portray real people, politicians, and, uh, and with imperfection of the face, exaggerated, so they could actually be identified even better. The word veristic come from the Latin verus, true. So this were realistic of what actually is the true aspect of what people see. In the paintings, of course, they obtain also something similar. Daily life was portrayed freely and realistically became even more realist later, and we owe this to the, what was remained of Pompeii after the Vesuvius destroyed. 
and maintain these incredible paintings. You can see them in space with no problem about the, the sexual appearances. And you can see that they are in excellent uh, space with, uh, with very detailed and various true to life. This realism in, in Pompeii, very humanistic. You can see here a couple of people from Pompeii, a, a husband and a wife. And you can see this very gentle woman with already a sense of uh, reality, but just touching in colors and outlines. We'll get back to this when we talk about modern paintings. The perspective building was still not quite correct. And on one hand, you can see here that the buildings are in space, but not quite in the space that we are accustomed to see now. In parallel, some figures were painted well, but uh, with some paradoxical sizes, the people close to us look at smaller than the people further away. So they're, they're not quite yet there, but they develop very quickly still at the end of the empire, so Pompeii is a good example. Some painting of spaces with the lines of buildings, which follow pretty much what was discovered later to be the rules of perspective, with a banishing line going all the way to the horizon. So, in a way, we can see that the art became more realistic with a good space representation, even in the absence of uh, very strong lines, and some hint of impressionism. You can see the trees here, not in detail, but just a sense that what you see is what your brain tells you to see. We'll return to this indeed in more modern times. So, I'd like to end this uh, first part of my talk from Kai painting to Roman realism by concluding that Roman culture almost reached full realistic representation of space and of humans in it. So, cheer up and I hope you join me for the next one.